We'll continue on now with part two of our lesson that compares and contrasts Java platform threads and Java virtual threads. In this second part of the lesson, we'll show how to create Java platform threads and virtual threads, and also walk through some of the best practices to consider when you apply Java virtual threads in your application. A Java platform thread can be created in two different ways. The first way is the traditional way. For example, we could make a new class, GCD thread, that extends the thread class, and then we could go ahead and make an instance of this GCD thread class and start the GCD thread, which will go ahead and launch the thread and have it run the run hook method shown above. An alternative way to go about implementing a thread is to implement the runnable interface. For example, create a new class called GCD runnable, make an instance of the GCD runnable class, pass that to a new thread object, and start that thread in order to invoke the run hook method. Traditional Java thread objects are relatively heavyweight and inflexible. So there needs to be some other ways to create them and use them. One very modern Java way, in other words, Java 19 and beyond, is to create and start a Java platform thread so it executes as a GCD runnable. This approach looks exactly the same as the traditional way. And that's because by default, a traditional Java thread is a platform thread. A more flexible way to create and start a platform thread to execute GCD runnable is to use the of platform factory method and then call the start method on the platform thread created by of platform. This very modern Java way of creating a platform thread is more flexible than the traditional Java way of starting a thread because here you can create an unstarted platform thread and then later start it so it executes GCD runnable. However, as we saw before, Java platform threads are relatively heavyweight. So we'd prefer an alternative way to do things if possible. We're now going to talk about various ways of creating Java virtual threads. Virtual threads can also be created in very modern Java. In this example, we'll use the same GCD runnable class as we did for the platform thread discussion. In particular, we create a new instance of GCD runnable, but now we're going to call the start virtual thread method defined on the thread class, which is a nice concise way to create and start a Java virtual thread so it executes the GCD runnable object. A more flexible way to create and start a virtual thread is to use the of virtual factory method to create a virtual thread and then call it start method. So that will execute the GCD runnable object. As with platform threads, you could also create unstarted virtual threads and then later start those threads so they execute the runnables that are passed to them. The nice thing about Java virtual threads compared to platform threads is they're relatively lightweight. So you can create millions and millions of them without incurring the same overhead required by the underlying operating system kernel to manage and execute all those threads. We'll now turn our attention to a number of virtual thread best practices. You should consider following these best practices when you apply Java virtual threads to your programs. First, don't pool virtual threads. That defeats the whole purpose of using them. In particular, creating virtual threads is inexpensive, so there's really never a need to pool them. For example, if you want to create 20 million virtual threads, you can simply create 20 million virtual threads rather than trying to pool a smaller number of threads and reuse them. Likewise, you should avoid using thread local variables with virtual threads. In particular, if an app uses thread local and creates 1 million virtual threads, then 1 million thread local instances are also created, which can be prohibitively expensive and unnecessary, especially when you consider the new scoped values feature that's been added to Java recently, which enables the sharing of immutable data within and across threads. And as you can see, if you take a look at this link, they're preferred using thread local variables, especially when you have large numbers of virtual threads. The next best practice to consider is to avoid the use of synchronized blocks. Synchronized blocks have been around in Java since the very beginning, and they make it straightforward to provide a critical section where only one thread at a time can access some shared resource. However, synchronized blocks pin a virtual thread to a platform thread, and therefore you should avoid their use whenever possible if you plan to use virtual threads extensively. Instead, use Java reentrant locks. There's a bit more ceremony involved with using a reentrant lock. For example, you need to get used to using the try finally blocks in order to unlock the lock, regardless of what happens in the block of code that accesses the shared resource. However, reentrant locks also provide many other features than Java synchronized blocks. For example, they can be interrupted more flexibly and responsively. They provide both timed and non-blocking methods to acquire locks without waiting if they're available. And they also support more flexible lock acquisition and release protocols that aren't bound by the scope locking restrictions of blocks of code in Java. 
So that's the end of the second part of our discussion of Java platform threads versus Java virtual threads.